We're going to meditate on the word Buddha. And I want to make sure that this message is given. Let us look into James chapter 4, verse 17. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord is read in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. God is good, and forevermore is his mercy. Well, brethren, we're going to be seeing in this precious afternoon topic about sin. The title of the message is The Sin of Omission. Because many times when we think about sin, we can think about sin as what we speak of and things that we think and do with our actions. But sometimes we don't think much on sins for what we don't do. And that many times, beloved brethren, is something that that is why many times in the church, just like in all of history, from even the first congregation, speaking about Israel, and in all the times, many times also, it is because of the sin of omission for which it does not permit God to glorify himself how he wants. And when we speak about omission, well, to explain about omission, what is it to omit something? Because when someone omits something, we can explain it in a way where someone does not realize an action they do not take it to happen they don't make it happen or something that they don't say and we're talking about not doing or saying those things that we are told to do and say according to scripture an example of omitting something can be not just actions, but can also be words. For example, in not mentioning certain something to which that could cause us to be counted as sinners in a sin of omission. And when we look at these things, it's important, as I have said, that we should know that there is a sin that exists which is the sin of omission and we must also know that to not obey god is to is sin and all sin has its reward even though at the very moment when things happen it does not appear like anything's going to go wrong but after we see the effects and something very important for us to do is that we need to act that we need to begin to act in obedience so that we do not enter into the sin of omission. Praise be the Lord forevermore. When we look at all these in life, sometimes, brethren, we must omit from doing something or commenting, making certain comments about certain topics or circumstances. To not hurt someone. And on certain occasions and in certain circumstances that is not counted as sin. But seen as wise. But on other occasions when we do not act and when we do not speak. It can be taken as sin. And we're going to see some examples this night brethren. For example if we could speak about the following examples. If we omit, for example, some words, you might remember in the Bible when the prophet Samuel, God sent him to go and anoint 
the new king, King David. But the people already had a king, King Saul. So Samuel was worried and said to the Lord God, But Lord, if Saul realizes that I am going to go and anoint someone else's king, he'll kill me. And God said to him, Go and say to them that you will do a sacrifice at that place. And truly he went to go and, and do a sacrifice. So he said in part what he was going to go and do, and he did go do what he said he was going to do. But there was another part of what he did where he was instructed by God to omit that in saying it. So he did not say that part. And that was not counted as sin toward Samuel. But when we also see, when we're talking about actions, because what we just spoke about was something that Samuel omitted with his words. He did not say he was going to go anoint King uh, David as king, but he just went and did it. But when we're looking at omitting in actions, we can take an example of Joseph and Mary. You may remember that they were betrothed to get married. And suddenly we see Mary pregnant. But this was now a work of the Holy Spirit that Mary was advised over this. But when this begins to take place, brethren, and we see that when someone is betrothed, it is like they're already married because they're already committed to each other. They cannot be playing around. And also they would not be able to play around because that's not of God. But we, the Bible says that when Joseph was thinking of these things, being a just man, he did not want to, he wanted to put her away privately. He didn't want to make a big uh, problem out of this. So simply he was going to just privately give her a letter of divorce and just so that she can go her way and he would then go his way. He was not going to report her to the elders or the judges at the time so that she could get stoned because that was usually the penalty. But because this was a work of God, God spoke to, he, to, to Joseph and said, take her as your wife because the baby that's in her womb is a work of the Holy Spirit of God. And we see that there are certain actions when we omit them, they are not counted to us as sin. Because there are sometimes things that when we do or say, they can be the cause of causing destruction to a family, of damaging someone. But this night I want to focus on when there is omission of things and when there is sin in that omission. Because that is what many times breaks our communion with God. And we're going to see some examples of that in the Bible. For example, we can see, you may remember, let's go to the Bible. Judges chapter 1 verse 27. Let's commence there. When God gives the people of Israel the promised land and he says to them and commands them to go and do the work that they had to do and tells the people of Israel that they had to expel the other nations that were there from out of there, all the tribes that were already there in the land of Canaan, because God was giving it to the Israelites in their hand. But look at what happened. They were, they were doing at first what God had told them. But along the way, we're now going to see this verse, which says, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean and her towns, nor Tanakh and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and her towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblam and her towns. It's giving us names of towns and tribes that existed in that land of Canaan, which the Israelites, specifically this tribe of Manasseh, a tribe of Israel, had to drive out these people. Why? Because these people were 
practicers that used to practice witchcraft, Satanism, idolatries. And we also see, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo and her towns. And it came to pass when Israel was strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute and did not utterly drive them out. Look, and this brethren, it like appeared that nothing wrong would go, that nothing would go wrong. It would appear that they were showing mercy to these nations, but we cannot be more merciful than God. We cannot be more loving than God. Neither. And when we continue, it says in the word, neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer. So it's almost like this began to spread, right? One tribe of Israel did it. The next tribe of Israel started doing it. And it was almost like it looked like a good idea because now they'll have people paying them tributes. And then the next tribe of Israel did the same and the other tribe. And we can just keep reading this going on the same path. But the point in all this, you know, is that when they began to not do, when they began to omit in part, because in part they went as God had told them, but on the other part, they were not doing it completely how God had told them. So in this, they were wrong because that door that was opened, the door of disobedience was the one in which the enemy gets in. And these Israelites began to mingle themselves with the women and men of those nations, intermarry with them and to have children with them. And when those things happened, they began to also take on board their gods and they started to go on the way of apostasy. They began to pass their children through the fire, sacrificing their own children to the devil Moloch and many things like that. For the which God then permitted that the Israelites be conquered by other nations, by the same enemies that they went after. And this is what happens, brethren, that when they began to cry out to the Lord because they could no more put up with, with a, because now they were slaves. Now, were, now they were under the foot of their enemy. Then God was moved to mercy. And God, having mercy, would raise up judges for them. Twelve judges we can count between Othniel and the prophet Samuel, which was also a judge. And it results that in all of this, that when the judge was around and God would give them victory through the judge, they would then come back to the Lord. They would obey the word. But when the judge would die... They would turn again and go back to the idolatry. And this is how they were, back and forth, back and forth all the time. Praise be the Lord. When we see the example of King Saul, now in the time of the kings, when they had the judges, then they asked for a king. And when King Saul, being the first king of Israel, when we you can look at this in first of Samuel chapter 15. And what it says there in that chapter of first of Samuel, chapter 15, we see that God gives a word to the prophet Samuel, who was a judge as well at the time. And he went to tell King Saul that he had a mission to go and complete, to go to the house of Amalek, to the Amalekites. He had to go kill King Agag, which was the king of the Amalekites. And God said specifically that he could not leave anything alive because everything had been contaminated with sin, animals, babies elders, women, children, all, because all was contaminated with sin. But this king, King Saul, went and in part completed his mission. 
And on the other part, well, he had brought back King Agag. He had brought back also um, flock as well as women to the witch. The Lord had to speak through the prophet Samuel again to give King Saul a word and says, this time I reject you as king. You know, because King Saul, he was not walking right with God in that moment either. Because before that, he had burnt a sacrifice, which was not his place to do. Because before, in the war that they had, Samuel delayed in coming. But in that delay, King Saul took it upon himself what was not his to do. And when the prophet Samuel came, he said, you have done foolishly because today your kingdom would have been established. But now God has given it to another. God had still not rejected him. He was in bad steps. Yes. But in this moment where we looked at with King Agag, yes, he rejected him completely. And that is sad, brethren, because we all know what happens when the protection of God is no longer there. The enemy is very, very there, right there, and he doesn't waste time. Now, let's look. Let's fast forward in time a bit from that time of Israel. And let's go to the New Testament. Let's look at what happened in Acts chapter 7, verse 51 to 53. You may remember when the church received the Holy Spirit of God, the baptism, and the, the gospel was being preached and God was manifesting with power and might. They got Stephen through lies and they took him to the council. And this is what happened. That when he was explaining to the council, because they had asked him, are these things true that you are blaspheming and speaking against the law and against the law of Moses? Then Stephen began to give them a bit of the history of how the scripture mentions it. But in this particular moment in scripture, it's like the Holy Spirit took over the words he was saying to speak to all those in the council, all those Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and the doctors of the law. And he begins to say these words and says, Ye stiff necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the, of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Look, brethren, they did not keep it. They did not follow it through. That was the sin. They omitted, and they also did many other things. They changed parts of the word. So when we do what God tells us, there is blessing. But when we're talking about keeping the word, because that's what we're going to talk about now, because all of this we looked at has to do with keeping the word of God and making sure that we do not omit in anything of word or actions when it's talking about the commandments that God has given us to do, each of us as individuals as well as a congregation. And when we are looking at all of this, brethren, we are seeing that when we're talking about keeping the word of God, obeying the word of God, look at what it says in John chapter 14, verse 21. Can't be more clear, brethren. And these are the words of Jesus. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Now, when it says that Christ will manifest himself to us, there can be many examples of that in the Bible we can see. How many times did Jesus manifest himself to Paul when Paul was there on the ground 
you know, her from from being uh, persecuted for preaching the gospel. These men, brethren, were people who who would preach Christ and would always look to have more and more encounters with God. And when God would manifest to them more and more, they would fall more in love with God because it says there that my father would love them because God would show himself to them through Christ by giving them cities converted to Christ and by fulfilling their petitions one after the other, answering them. All of those things increasing their faith, brethren. That's why these men uh, embraced the cross, which means to suffer for the Christ, for the for the cause of Christ. They didn't suffer for their own cause; they suffered for Jesus' sake. And this was because they had learned to constantly see the glory of God. And when a father is happy with his son, when he's pleased with his son, of course that if the son asks something, he gives it to him because the, the father easily gives it because he's pleased with his son. Because of the way that his son has been conducting himself, because of the behavior of his son. And that, brethren, is something that is lived. And we can live it nowadays as well. But there are moments, brethren, that it's almost like when we ask of God something and it's like that petition does not get answered. And I know, I understand, brethren, that many times God also has his plan. He has his time. But when we're talking about almost all petitions we ask and nothing's happening, well, it's because there's something wrong. There's something that needs to get fixed. There's something that we need to put into account with God so that he can be glorified and respond. And also when we're asking something, one day, I've been in reunions, brethren, where one day you've, we've asked for something and they're receiving the answer the next day. They're, they're getting their, their, their prayers answered the next day and that's constantly, brethren. I'm not talking about it, it, you got to wait for a month or two, no. We were in a prayer meeting one week, next week when we're in prayer meeting, there's a lot of brethren that are actually testifying that God has been answering their prayers. And we see the brethren, the brothers and sisters are saying, brother, we've got a testimony. Can I testify? I've got a... And each week we're getting testimonies. Each week, brethren. So those are the things. Do we want to reach to that or not? Because that's possible. Those times have not come to an end. We are in those times. The Bible says clearly, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them. Keeping them means that we have to act. Keep it can also mean to omit as well sometimes. Because there are biblical verses where it says, He who keeps his, 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 uh, his, his mouth keeps his soul. Because we know that sometimes the enemy comes to provoke because he wants us to get angry and speak things that aren't right. And then we're going to have to repent or that we might end up falling in sin because of words that we speak wrongly. But God speaks, shows us that things that are sin, we need to omit those things from coming out of our mouth and from acting on them. But there are things that God says that we must do or we must say. And if we don't do or say them, then that is sin. Because that is called disobedience, brethren. That is called not keeping the commandments, not keeping the word. And when we don't keep the word, well, that same word that we're seeing there, we can put it on the other side as well. Where it says, He that does not have my commandments, he doesn't, and does not keep them, he does not love me. And he that does not love me, shall not be loved by my father and i will not love him and i will not manifest myself to him make sense and these are things brethren that many times occur and we say why is my petition not being answered why this why that right but we need to analyze ourselves right this word this afternoon is a word of exhortation for our lives but as I said to you, I'm preaching to myself because this needs to commence with me first.
than you. So you know the responsibility that I have is great. It's not easy. But at the same time, brethren, it must be done. And I ask the Lord that he give me the strength that I may obey him and that nothing hold me back for nothing and for no one. Because we have our personal responsibility before God and our congregational one also. So when we're seeing how things are happening around us, well, we know the wars, the wars that the people of Israel had to go through. We know how much they had to suffer, how many people died. And when they were placed as slaves under the feet of their enemies, and that was because they gave their back to God for not obeying the Lord. Things were always going wrong, even though in part they would obey, but because of the part they would disobey, that's the part that went bad for them. Because when there's disobedience, that's an open door for the devil to get in and he won't waste time. And unlike us, who we need to rest our mind and rest our bodies, the enemy doesn't need that. He's a spirit. So he's looking around who he will devour day and night. Holy Lord, may God help us. Because when we were talking about keeping the word. If we go back to verse 21, where it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. Now let's take that, brethren, to our time, to this time, because we've seen the old time. But what, what matters to us now is how am I going to put this word into practice in my life? What is it that God wants to speak to me? Because when we see, brethren, the examples that in that moment, in the, back then, it was a physical war that they went through, an actual war of swords, of spears, of arrows, of cutting and killing physically. The war continues, brethren. But in this war, it is spiritual. The enemy has not gotten tired of making war. He still does it. Or have we not seen around the world how many people have taken a step back in their faith and left Christianity? And there are others that have moved forward and stepped up in their faith. Glory to the Lord. Because the commandment we have is he who endures to the end, he who perseveres to the end, he shall be saved. But when it speaks about persevering, what is it speaking that about persevering? It's not just the simple saying that because I've persevered and I've gone to the church and I say that I'm a Christian, I've persevered. No, brethren. That's just in part. To persevere, it is at your workplace. To persevere, it is in the universities for those who go to the university. To persevere, it's in the matrimony for those who are married. To persevere is in the family for those who have family. To persevere, it's in the street when we are out on the street. To persevere, is wherever we find ourselves. Because to keep the commandments is to keep the, the holy word, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, to not let ourselves be diverted to nowhere, to not allow the enemy who comes in these days. He doesn't come with, with a, a physical weapon in that way, in that war. You're not going to see an army of 300,000 that get up against you with uh prepared for the war in that way no this battle is spiritual and the enemy sends his attacks he casts forth the war bringing things through the law changes in workplaces regulations and changes decisions that go against the bible 
That is why it's important that we have that close communion with God. Because when those things come by deception to deceive our lives so that we don't realize. But the God that we have, the God that I know, he's the one that talks to us. He, he warns us. He tells us when things are wrong. He shows us when we should not do certain things. He shows us beforehand when there's a danger that's coming our way. And when it comes, he speaks to us in the spirit and we he opens up our, our attention and we say, well, this is what God was talking to me about. Because many of these things, brethren, look, many times in the workplace, they want you to change. In what ways? Sometimes they want you to change the way you dress. Sometimes the way you speak. Sometimes in the workplace, the manager will say, no, what I'm looking for is people who on every Friday after work, we're going to go to a pub or we're going to go somewhere. And we're, as we're, you know, look, we're a mini family, so we're going to go and have a good time. And we're going to get to know each other and they go and do things that are things that the Bible says we can't do as Christians. And so every every Friday they all go to the pub to drink. They, they do and say whatever they want and then they're working again on Monday. And that's part of what the, the owner or the manager wants to have done in his team or the, his workers. And there's work, there's work that's like that. And even with all that, in universities, those who study, they bring other philosophies and things that are contrary, contrary to Christ. Even children, when they go to school, they show them some things that are anti-biblical as well. All of that, brethren. And when we're talking about that, if we keep the word, those who keep the commandment, those are the ones that love God. And that's why when we look to see what the Bible says, the Bible also teaches us that the people of God would worry for their children, would worry about teaching their children. Look, brethren, like in the case of Moses, if Moses' mother, if she would not have worried about her son, Moses, to show him in that time that she had, because the Bible shows that as a baby, at three months, they had to send him out. But then his own sister said to the Egyptian women, a daughter of Pharaoh, and said to her, Look, I know a lady who can take care of her. So she was taken back to her. So Moses was taken back to his biological mother so she could teach him the things of God. Because the mother of Moses, while he was growing up and being weaned, she would teach him who the God of the Israelites were, who his people were. Our God, she would teach him, is not the God of the Egyptians. So that's why the Bible registers that when Moses was 40 years of age, he felt in his heart that he wanted to go and get to know his people. How did he know that that was his people? How did he know that, that, that they had a different God and all that? That's because... Now, how is it that why he would he decide to leave Egypt, having the world in his hands, to go to the unknown? Because his mother showed him God's things. And that's important for these times, brethren. Because those who have family need to have a, a family church at home once a week, at least. They need to worry about their children and what they're being taught and to, that their children have an encounter with the Holy Spirit because over there in school, wherever they are, they're six hours over there or more sometimes. And they are in exposure to that war that they want to bring other ideas into their heart, into their mind, to bring Satanism into them. And that is why many lives in the church Within the church, many children have been lost because many times the parents don't teach them. They have not worried about it. They've put the responsibility to the youth leader. They want to see results. But what's two hours a week in the church going to do? Two hours, brethren, when they have 30 hours or more a week that they're putting other things in their mind. And that's not to say, what are their friends also putting in their minds? So this is a war, brethren, a spiritual war. That just as we see 
that the good is about to run out and it's sort of it looks it appears lost then god is glorified in those moments but who wants that god uses their life who wants to be that that life that god uses to use those judges now i'm not saying that we're going to become judging judges to judge people no but god can use someone to raise them up in a revival but that revival needs to begin with that life that is determined to give it all for the lord god and when i say all i'm talking about even give their very life for the cause of christ and that means suffering for his sake that is carrying the cross and that's not what many people want to do and there are many that are waiting for someone else pay that price because they don't want to pay it themselves and it's almost like everyone well in the majority of the world because there's revivals in other places maybe here we may not be seeing it as much but it doesn't mean that there is none in other places of course there are can we see it here also yes we can but we must pay the price and that price hurts that price is price of faith of submitting to the word of god because when we see all of these things brethren we see that the war truly is ferocious. The war is ferocious. And the sons of God need to stand firm, brethren. Firm in the teaching. Firm in the doctrine. Because that is the only way that we will overcome. Obeying the word and acting. Not staying on the sidewalk waiting for others to act when god gives to each of us the opportunity because to each of us god has given us life each day his mercy has extended towards us in this day god has given us one more day of life and that is why brethren each of us have the responsibility to keep the word it doesn't matter what situation we find ourselves in, but that the word dwell richly in our hearts and abound so that the lives out there who are in darkness can see that light that is shining in you and that they can come to the light of Jesus Christ. Praise be the name of God. Look, brethren, when we speak about keeping the word, we can speak many things about that, but I'm not here to speak about many things. I'm here to speak so that we can analyze how we are before God, before the Lord. In what part are we failing him? In what part are we omitting? In that sin, that's to say the sin of omission. In what part would it be? In something that we're not saying because brethren when we look at the next biblical verse in Matthew chapter 28 from verse 18 to 20 it's very well known it's the Great Commission and how is the war now when you say brethren do you go out to evangelize and they say we we're not allowed we can't it can't be done it can't be done but look um and they they put a fine and then after uh no you, we can't it can't be done and just like that the devil has people slaughtering each other within the churches because of those laws the lords that are antichrist the laws that want to silence the gospel because then after when somebody gets a, gets a in encouragement to go and uh, do the work, there might be a letter that comes to the church and says, if you don't stop doing this, we're going to put a fine on you. And the pastor receives it and he gets worried because he says, oh, 
they're going to shut down the church. So he brings that little sheep that's been handing out the gospel. And that little sheep comes all happily because when we obey God, we are joyful. Because we're at peace with God. We're having a close communion with God. But now, because of being afraid, because of not having enough faith, the, the leader comes and says, well, sister or brother, you're not allowed to do that anymore. No, no, I'm not going to permit that. We don't want to have any problems. And then that little sheep is left, you could say, no longer lively, no longer happy. That's how the war is, brethren. Now, I don't like to jump ahead of things, but it comes to the case. What would happen if that happened to this church? What would be my reaction? Or what would happen, brethren, if I begin to spread the gospel out there and the letters begin to come? Well, because I'm the pastor, I'll just put them aside. But if the people begin to notice that we're having to pay fines for preaching the gospel, ask yourself, analyze yourself, would the war come to me from within this church from others worrying that the church would be shut down hey maybe they'll take away my house and or then they'll realize that i go to that church and that's my pastor that is, is appearing on the news that they're saying that he's a madman and and i'll be ashamed that they see that i'm at that church what will be our reaction? So those are the things, brethren, are the things that we need to define ourselves. That's what it is. Because there our faith will grow. Our communion with God will grow. I'm not saying it'll be easy because the enemy rises up. And the devil, the more that things are prolonged, the more... He fertilizes, he strengthens. It's like saying he has already many, many strongholds. Ooh, so many, so many, so many strongholds that he has already. But at the same time, brethren, when we prolong God's work and we detain ourselves and we don't act, when the word is not given, the enemy continues to strengthen those strongholds he makes them bigger from straw he converts them into wood and from wood to silver from silver he converts them into gold and he makes them very dense and solid like diamond and then truly somebody will look and say we can't do anything and you look over there oh i have to fight against all different sects of religions and so many different faiths in different things that that worship the very devil and I have to fight with anti-Christian laws and all these things here and those who oppose in abortion and adultery and fornication and there's a list without end brethren but all that what is that to God is God not greater than all of that? More powerful than all of that? Of course he is. But all of that in this time is the war. The war against many times people, it's not so easy when you say to them about Jesus because they say, where is Jesus? Bring him here. Where's salvation? And it appears like we have to know the whole universe so that we can go and satisfy their questions and their complaints. But that's not like that, brethren. Because one touch of the Holy Spirit is all that's needed to convince them. Because the one who convinces of sin, the one who convicts of sin is God, the Holy Spirit. And that is why we need to get into submission with God but that's not just saying I'm gonna get into fasting and prayer and I'm gonna study the Bible and study the Bible and I'm just gonna stay there 
that all that's good it, but everything has its function but to speak to someone the word to act is also part of obeying God and we've seen that in when we when we looked at the armor of God in a different message when we have the the feet shod with the gospel the preparation of the gospel of peace so there's going to be battles that's going to happen anywhere everywhere in the family within the church the neighbor the work colleague from wherever even someone who's just walking down the street you're minding your own business and the devil takes their mind and directs it to you to come and say a few bad words and you're like where'd that come from that happens also as many occasions it's happened when we go to a campaign the pastor or the preacher is going to go and he gets into a car accident because somebody comes and the car is completely destroyed but god has kept them alive they get to the campaign late but these things happen the enemy rises up brethren but god is more greater more powerful than all things and when we look at this verse this is the authority in which we go in when we go present christ we need to go believing look the very disciples in the time that they had received the baptism of the holy spirit and they had the first confrontment the bible registers that after they went to pray again and they said lord give us to speak your word in boldness and what is that because they were also seeing how the battle was rising up against them already to stop preaching the gospel of jesus and they said lord give to us that when we preach your word that at the same time your son jesus stretch out his hand in signs in wonders and in healings in miracles and the bible says that in that moment when they prayed the earth shook and they were once again filled with the holy spirit of god and the bible then registers that they then went and preached the word and when they preached it they were preaching it in boldness and what does that mean that god had given them authority to preach the word in their words that when those people laugh at you that when those people say that you're a liar that when those people say so many things that they can say you are so firm in your mind in whom you have trusted nothing will move you and with all assuredness and you would say god loves you but if you do not repent of your sins you will go to hell whether you believe it or not to stand firm brethren in front of opposition that's what it is brethren well one of our sisters testified once where she says that somebody got up and was angry at a bus uh, and but the lady the sister said in the name of jesus i rebuke you and people may think that we're crazy why why is that lady talking about rebuking the devil i'm the one talking to her so no we have to see that this is a spiritual war and that people who oppose the gospel of jesus because there's something there that moves them against the gospel of Jesus, because he, the, the thing that's moving them does not want them to come to Christ. And he wants to also stop you from preaching Jesus. Some people are not satisfied with just going, going away. They want to stop you from preaching the gospel. Who does that? The devil. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Now, we're on the earth. On this earth there are laws and we need to submit to the laws of the land but also God has given us laws which are above the earth laws for example if in the earthly laws they say to us we cannot preach the gospel of Jesus the celestial gospel law the law from heaven tells us go and preach the gospel which one are we going to obey even though in the law on earth take away all things from us 
the law from heaven will give us much, much more. And in a way where we never imagined possible. But for that, we need faith. For that, we need to believe the word of God. So he said, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So, when we see these things, brethren, we are seeing that truly, truly, we have to be defined. We have to define ourselves, who we are in Christ. This year is not going to be any better. I'll tell it to you now. It won't be better. You know why? Because even though there's no, let's just say if there was no plague from COVID, no pestilence, even if there was no natural disasters, the enemy of our soul is advancing in the corruption of the minds of people. And he advances in corrupting those minds of people. And he takes people to their own destruction. To stealing, to killing, to losing themselves, to the perverseness, which sooner or later, that could reach your very doorstep. To the which we, trying to protect our home, could lose it. For loving that more than the commandment of God. And it says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Look, in the middle of the trial, in the middle of the battle, in the middle of opposition, there God is. In the middle of the suffering, he's saying he's there with us. And if he's there with us and that happened, it's because God permitted it. And if God permitted it, it's because there's a purpose and we need to receive it with goodness, gladness. Because he knows what he's doing. Even though we may not know all things, but God is good. And everything he permits, he permits it because he's good. Because he has a purpose. Much more. So that we can realize it in our lives. And so that's why it says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. How can many of us can say amen? He's with us to the end of the world. To the end of, of this life. To the end of... Because look, brethren, many times, sometimes I, I, believe, I start to think that we, we grab hold so much of that thought... And we get comfortable on the word where it says that Jesus Christ will come and rapture the church and take it from this earth. And it's like we grab that to become comfortable and say, well, I'm waiting for the rapture of the church because I'm saved. But whilst we're waiting, we're comfortable, too comfortable in a way that we like say, well, I'm saved. And I'm going like this. I may not have much good works before God, but the Lord takes me like that. And that's what matters to me. Even though I might be poor in heaven, but as long as I made it. And we grab hold of that much to not do the rest of the things that we have got to do. And I say, how many may have gotten hold of that commodity? And look at when this pestilence came. And where is their faith? And what happens if God raises up the fire and says, now I'm going to permit for war to come? God can do it. God can permit it. And that person who was comfortable thinking, I'm going now, I'm going in the rapture. And yet the rapture did not come yet because there's still other things that in God's plan have to happen. And if that person did not advance in their faith, in that communion with God, well, look at the example that's around the world. How many their faith has tumbled over and now they find themselves out of the grace of God because they were too comfortable. What else can I say to you? 
Is it like that or not? Because brethren, when we are with the Lord, God has said there where we have just read that he will be with us to the end of the world. Look, I'll tell you this. God is not with us so that when we so we can end up defeated. God has not given us of his spirit so we can fail. Those who have failed in the faith is because they themselves disobeyed God. They saddened the spirit of God. They lost communion with God because of disobedience. And God, they couldn't hear the voice of God anymore. Months could pass and they were like that. Years could have passed. But when things got bad in life, they did not have enough faith. And there they fell from the grace of God. And I wait, brethren, that that does not happen to any of us who are here. Now you can understand the great task that we have before God. What does that mean, brethren? That means as a leader, I need to be an example to the church. It's not an easy thing, but it's not impossible either because we have the word of God, his promise and the word is truth. Praise be the Lord. Hallelujah. So we're going to see something else. Isaiah 61 verse 1. This was prophesied, brethren. The good news to take the good news. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. And when we look at the fulfillment of that prophecy, let's look at Ephesians 2.17. And came, speaking about Jesus, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were near. So you see, look, brethren, truly God, when we saw a different message as to what is it that God has given to the church, do you remember that? How many things we saw that God has given to the church, right? We saw that God has given Jesus Christ. He has given the Holy Spirit. God has given all blessings in the heavenly places. He has given the armor of God. And look, a whole list of things that God has given. He's given the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and many things that we cannot say. Oh, we can't. Right? We can't say we can't do the job that God wants us to do because we are seeing with that those eyes like the spies when they went, those 12 spies of Israel, when they went to spy out the land, the, the people and the land of Canaan, and they returned and they gave a bad report, all of them, but only two gave a good report, Joshua and Caleb. The rest said, we can't, we can't. Look, there's giants over there. And we were like grasshoppers to them. And the people began to say, oh, why did we come out of Egypt? This Moses that let's go back. And, and when these two men full of faith in the middle of the people, brethren, we can, brethren, the same God that has brought us out and did all those miracles from Egypt can. And the very people wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. If it was not for the intervention of God, they would have been stoned there. The very people wanted to stone them, the men of faith. But in that moment of danger, that they were determined to give their lives, is when God intervened. Those who have read many history books of the martyrs of Jesus Christ, we've been able to see certain things that when they tried to torture them, the very disciples, we can talk about one of them 
in the scripture, John, is, it says that they put him in like a massive pot of, of boiling oil. But when they put him in and took him back out, it says that he was laughing because nothing hurt him. And we see cases like that in the Bible that it shows us and in history as well. How many of us have not heard of it? That when people have been determined to give their life for the gospel and it's not been that moment that God will take them to, to take their soul to be at his presence forever. Well, then God intervenes in those moments because it, their time on earth has not come to an end. And that is why God will then be glorified in those moments so that we can take the gospel and that the souls be saved. And that we've seen it in many occasions. We've heard it in testimonies and some of us have even seen it with our eyes. And cases where they've put, you could say, a gun to the person's mouth to kill them and nothing happened. Because God does not permit when it's not their time. And if it's not their time, then nothing can take their life away. Until it is fulfilled all that God has for that person or what you have to do for the Lord. And that, brethren, is for our good. You know why? Because that's where the reward will be when we go to heaven and God says, Welcome, faithful servant. When we go through that process where everything will be shown that we've done in this earth and how much God has been glorified. Because every time God is glorified, our faith grows. And when our faith grows, it's not just to stay stuck. It's not to say that I'm retired now and I have bought it all and, and, I've, and I've got heaven won. Because that's when God permits for death to touch us and then we, our spirit parts from our body and we go to our place of rest. But our works do follow, right? But without before that, we have a great work to do in the Lord. So to finish up, brethren, the word, we need to live it. We must suffer for it and we must love it each day. Blessed be the Lord. So, beloved brethren, sometimes I see and I see it this way. We can spend years, right, doing things normal, normally, just as always. And we get to the end of life. And they give us a good burial and they sing to us songs at the burial and many things like that. But we ourselves know if we could have done more and we did not do more, that will always be there for an eternity. I personally don't want to be that feeling that way for an eternity before the Lord or worse, thinking that I'm going up to heaven and finding myself going, ending up in hell because of the sin of omission. That would be very sad, brethren. And for that, brethren, we need to obey the word of God. And in obeying the word of God, there we will see the glory of God. Now is left the question, do we want to see the glory of God? Do I want or do I want to continue how I am? Or do I want to have a sense to life that God manifest himself each day in my life with the heavens open each day and I can feel that prayer that reaches to him and that he respond to me immediately. And I can see how God changes the hearts around the lives. All of that, brethren, that comes with what God wants to do with our lives. So, beloved brethren, this is the word that God has given to me.